Hello, this is the RPG Pundit, the final boss in Internet Shitlords, and please try to ignore if you hear any construction noises that's coming from next door, and there's nothing I can do about it. So, um, today, I'm going to be reviewing Raiders of the Lost Artifacts, which is an OSR game that I've somehow managed to overlook. Please don't overlook my OSR games, though, like the Old School Companion and the Old School Companion 2, both of which are bestsellers on drive through you can check them out. The Old School Companion is full of material, sourcebook type material that you can use, spells and uh, and courtly intrigues and elves and uh, aristocratic activities and, and uh, new classes and critical tables and all kinds of other neat stuff uh, that you can uh, apply to any of your OSR games to give it a medieval authentic feel, all based on real medieval legend, lore and history. And the Old School Companion is 320 pages of uh, of pure medieval authentic adventures. Um, we have uh, 26, 25 or 26, I don't remember, <laughs> medieval authentic adventures um, all together. Different levels, different uh, types of adventure, but all of them, again, based on medieval lore, history and uh, and and culture. So check those out and check my other products. But today, I'm going to check out Raiders of the Lost Artifacts. And this is not a new game. It was published by uh, Night Owl Workshop back in 2017. So it's already had about five years. And yet somehow, I never managed to hear about it. I, I don't know. It just completely skipped my radar. And so I'm thinking maybe it skipped some of your radars too. Now, uh, I... I'm always very interested in OSR games, which this is, that are um, extensions of the OSR design school into areas that are not traditional, typical fantasy. You know, um, so stuff like my Invisible College RPG, which is a modern game, or even a science fiction game like, like Star Adventure. Raiders of the Lost Artifact is one of those games. And as you can kind of figure by the cover and the title, it's basically created to um, to emulate the genre of Indiana Jones movies. I think it's I think I can be even that specific because you could say, well, is this a pulp game? And it is. It is sort of a pulp game. It has pulp elements. I mean, it's got all the pulp elements in it. And you can certainly run any kind of a, a kind of adventure action hero type game set in the 1930s. You could run that in this. Um, system, but I it, I think you're going to see it's very specifically an homage to Indiana Jones, and uh, I'm going to give spoilers here. If this is all you need to know, I really like this product. I really do. Um, so if that's enough for you, <laughs> that if you know, okay, it's it's very clearly an, um, uh, uh, a genre emulation of Indiana Jones, and the RPG Bundit likes it. I guess if you really want to, you can stop watching the video right now. Um, if not, if you want more of the details, then uh, keep watching, uh, because there's a lot of interesting stuff about this product. If you're not totally convinced yet, um, that might be it might be helpful for you to keep watching. So. The game book itself is only, what is it, 122 pages long, really, 123, counting the quote that is directly from Raiders of the Lost Ark there. Um, as you can see, it's got a, a good format, and there's an important amount of art in there. It's all black and white, soft cover. And uh, it uh, it packs a, a very good amount in the size that it, that it encompasses. You know, it's got a full set of rules, a full set of OSR rules. Um character sheet there. Bit inconvenient having the character sheet there. They don't have it at the very back. No, they don't. Okay. But anyways, that's that's their character sheet. Um, but it, as you can see, it's just your basic OSR character sheet. There isn't a, a, lo a large amount of deviation from the core mechanics here, which is really a good, a good deal. The attributes, you can see, are the same as typical. Um, Saving throws are done pretty much the way my saving throws are done, which is that there's a single number and you roll um, with a, you have to roll higher than that number, equal or higher rather, and uh, you have modifiers to ability scores based on the type of, um, of saving throw that it is. They just the only thing that changes is that instead of calling it a saving throw, they call it luck. Uh, well, also they add a an optional rule here 
that if you have a 19 or 20, then it's a lucky break and things go extra well for you. If you have a one or two, you have a bad break and things go extra badly for you. Hit points. Uh, characters start with max hit points at level one, which I don't like much, but <laughs> so be it. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, suffice it to say that there's, you know, like all the... All the, all the info that you need is is here for the basic playing of the game. Um, I'm, I would probably say that, that in terms of the, the writing, it's quite good. It's very clear. There are some areas that have slight typos. Like, for example... Um, no, where was that? Here. You've got, uh, here it lists 4 to 6 as a minus 2 to the attribute, when we all know, of course, it's 4 or 5. Uh, and, and in fact, in this game, that is not just a rule change, because you can see here they, they, it is 4 and 5. Um, also, there's some areas in the weapons where you have some rules. It talks about rate of fire. It says rate of fire is the maximum number of projectiles can be fired each combat round. Um... And then it doesn't really tell you anything more about that, about that or about how to do bursts, because it says here is two bursts. So what's the difference between two bursts and, uh, you know, a rate of fire that's just two? How does a burst work? It never, it never, at least I didn't see um, where it talks about how to do bursts. It's not anywhere in the, in the equipment that I could see, and there, it's not anywhere in the combat. Um, also... There are some of these, um, some of these asterisks end up not really appearing correct to me. Uh, so, for example, down here, the weapons, you have one, two, three, and four asterisks, right? Except that if you look at the table, there's one, two, and four asterisks. So three is easily concealable, and four is targets must hit a dexterity luck roll or suffer minus two to AC for one round. Um, so one of those two must apply to the whip and the other one to the dagger, and, and it was obviously that one of these two is meant to be a three um, asterisk situation. Um, but it they, they, they screwed it up, right? So there's a few of those kind of slight errors that, that, you know, you could have just had some better proofreading and uh, maybe some better explanation about exactly how they want bursts to work because it really doesn't make it um, too clear in the mechanics here. Um, going back, character classes, all of this is just fine. You've got the mercenary, who's your tough guy fighter, brawler, marksman, etc., Mad scientist there. <laughs> well, not necessarily mad, but he's a scientist. And he creates gadgets at the same way that a wizard might do spells. They're special gadgets. Um, treasure hunter. This is your, your Indiana Jones type, who is a variant, I guess, of the Thief or the Rogue. Um, character levels are covered to 10. It has titles, which is a little silly for a modern game. Like, that's just a throwback. But okay, <laughs> that, that's all right. Multi-classing rules, languages. This is how you know that this is directly, directly a uh, an Indiana Jones um, spoof, right? It's because it talks about a phobia, right? <laughs> here, here you have to, you have to. Every character is supposed to roll to see one thing that they're afraid of, which doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. I mean, this is a cool table; it's fine. And uh, actually, there's like an expanded version of this table in the appendix, right? So that it goes, instead of having 20 entries, it has another 100, does it? I'm not sure if it's 100 or not. Let's see here. Uh, 80. Okay, 80. So it, it, that's that allows you 80 plus 20, right? That's even more clever. Um, but the idea that every single character has one phobia, just because Indiana Jones is famously, you know, afraid of snakes... Uh, you know, it just seems sort of, sort of silly. Um, background is covered without any kind of special mechanical part to it. And, uh, and there you go. So those are, those are your basic classes. There's another class later on, which is the occultist, which is presented as an optional or NPC class. Um, in, so like in all, the character creation is, is really good. Here are the, the gadgets that the, 
the scientist makes. So, you, you know, level one gadget might be like an aqualung or something. Level five could be a robot you know? <laughs> so, or a dimensional gate. Um, depending on what type of pulp treasure hunter type game you want to run, this might not be appropriate, right? So like maybe scientists might not be the cla a class you include. Um, and then it gets, you know, to talk about like archaeological relics, which can have real powers, obviously, at Indiana Jones they do, so, so it makes sense that you could in this, right? Um, there are rules for hire hirelings and specialists, which I think makes a lot of sense in a, in a archaeological treasure hunter campaign. Um, but none of the rules here are a big surprise necessarily. All of it is, is found in one edition of D and D or another. Um, and then you get into like campaign and adventure design. You've got features and tropes, you know, cliffhangers, lost worlds, the rival investigators, um, the SS archeological weirdos, um, schools of pseudo-archaeology so you have the ancient astronaut school the lost super civilization school comparative mythologists uh nazi archaeology and other uh na uh na nationalist archaeologists and religious archaeologists um then you have one issue three uh, fringe theorists okay uh, so then there's like samples of relics and this is like great stuff. This is stuff that you could use, you know, I could see you making use of this, this historical or pseudo historical material, because a lot of this is pseudo historical, um, in the you know, Lion and Dragon. I mean, Cross Your Mars, I, I have that sword in Lion and Dragon. You know, it's one of the magic items in Lion and Dragon, right? Cronus is sickle, um, Guy Bulg, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, the Golden Apples, King David's Sword. So these are like all archaeological um, relics that theoretically could be, you know, the focus of a of a search or a campaign. Not all of them are real, as I said, you know, Necronomicon, <laughs> Pandora's Box. I, I mean, by real, I mean not even necessarily real in like history, right? <laughs> the Necronomicon is not a historical object. Um Chapter five, tomes and traps. So these are some sample traps. Not not all that important, but this table is great. Random generation table. So you've got, you know, the MacGuffin you're looking for. PCs find out about it. Who helps them? Where to find it? What's it guarded by? What does it include? Random trap generation. Like this, these few pages alone, you could use that in so many things. I could see using that in the Invisible College. You know, I could use, see using it and just about anywhere you know like it's it's a great set of tables that's take note venger that's how you make a good set of random tables you know they're interconnecting etc <laughs> monsters and adversaries include things like cultists and femme fatales created with tribesmen gorillas uh not like monkeys but you know uh guerrillas hill bandits um soldiers swordsmen but then there's also real monsters in there like ghouls golems uh, bronze clockwork mechanisms, giant robots, mummies, mermaids. Um, so, you know, you can decide as a DM, do you want this campaign to be mostly like, um, quote unquote, realistic pulp where you're, you know, it's people fighting people and maybe, you know, animals that are, that really exist or things like, I don't know, a cave bear or something, <laughs> but, or do you want it to be like, you know, Indiana Jones versus Dracula, you know, because you could do that too with this. Yeah. So it's uh, it's wide open. Um, got lampreys and horses here. I don't know when I switch sides. Here. There we go. Um, giant squids. Uh, and then you have the appendix. Real world heroes, villains, places, and things. This is another great, great info that they've got here. Um, with like real stuff about real history and mythology that like covers so much cool stuff. <laughs> I mean, this, this, this is all stuff that I could use in an invisible college campaign, for example. Um, some of it has, is in the invisible college campaign, you know, in the, in my, in my invisible college book. So, uh, lots of great material there. Then there's the occultist class also in the appendix. Um, 
Which, you know, in some campaigns, it might not make sense to have a mad scientist as a PC class, but you might want to have the occultist. And I think it's really clever. It's not authentic, you know, it's not a medieval authentic magic or something, or, or modern authentic magic like uh, Invisible College. It is, uh, instead, you know, the, uh, um, the occultist has a sense of magic, esoteric knowledge, which is a, done in a percentage for some reason, and... Uh, and spells, and the spells are not actually D and D spells, um, but they're also not. Um, they're also not not uh, some non Vancian sort of thing. They're they're just um, simplified versions of and, and you know spells that have been made, particularly for this type of genre. I think they're pretty good, you know, hateful tentacles of Mong. <laughs> I like the names, Igrigor's calcification. It's uh, you know, it's the sort of thing you would have seen in thirties um, weird fantasy. So you know, Benin's veil, the creeping crawling curse, you know. and also occultists. Every time they level up, they have to do a check to see if they gain some kind of physical corruption, which is a that is a great mechanic. That's a mechanic that you could use in any weird fantasy. So I have to give credit. There's also, uh, and there, at the end, there's a sample adventure based on the Ring of the Nibelungen, uh, and a section on skills, which are optional. You can you can include skills as a mechanic um, or not. So that's pretty clever too. And the aforementioned phobia table, inspirational reference. Really, the only thing that should really be here is Indiana Jones, but whatever. Um, and uh, and that's it, right? So this was written by Darren Watts, Thomas Denmark, and David Pulver. Well, my congratulations to them because uh, it is a really fantastic product. I'm not sure how much it costs. I, I do believe that you can get this on um, Drive Through RPG. I'm going to put the link in the description. I'm going to find the link <laughs> and put it in the description. I probably should have checked that before I did this video, but you know me. It's always lo-fi here, <laughs> so I'm... Uh, I'm sure I'll find it though. So check out if you want to pick up Raiders of the Lost Artifacts. Look at the link in the description of this video. Um, I'm doing. Yeah, I've got a lot of video of uh, products to do reviews of. Um, so there's, uh, there's still a ton of the Lamentations books. I got, uh, I think three, counting this one of the products from um, Night Owl Workshop, and uh, I've also got the Tonisberg Dungeon book, which uh, is um, an interesting product. So I'm going to be going back and forth just to to make it. Uh, it's not all Lamentations all the time. So like, you know, the next one I'll do a Lamentations one and then I'll I'll keep going from there. Um, but yeah, keep checking out if you like the reviews. Please uh, remember, my review videos never get as much as my rant. So if you like me doing review videos, please share the video. Share it anywhere you can. I mean, it's not even controversial. Right? I'm not talking about anything controversial here. So you can share it on any of your, <laughs> any of the social media you have related to gaming, and uh, you know that that's a, an encouragement for me to make more reviews more often because, you know, I know. I mean, I like doing the reviews, so I enjoy being able to do them, even if it gives me less views than a than a video where I'm complaining about, you know, the weirdo new uh, D and D setting that has no conflict, you know, <laughs> and no white people, you know. So, yeah, but you know, if you share this video then uh, that's a good way to encourage me to make more video reviews. Um, I hope that you, uh, you enjoyed this. I guess that's everything for today. Currently smoking. This is a uh, Nirup Cuddy plus Argento Natural. <laughs>